Jones. But I'll tell you what blues tells a story. You know, if you if you sit there and listen to it, it will you get something out of it. And I'll say one thing: if you haven't had them, if you keep living, you will have them. <laughs> yeah, you have the blues. Suffering music. Cannonball said that blues is suffering music. Yeah. And the majority of people who play blues are sufferers. And the sufferers, the majority of sufferers in the world are black. <laughs> so blues is a black music. And it, you you can't you can't play blues and 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 born rich. This type of music is the only creation that the United States or that America has given to music that we can say that we donated this art form. This is the only art form that we've given. And uh, we've, we are letting it slide through our fingers just like we let everything else. You know, and essentially it was a black creation, a black art form and black people have totally lost it. buckets with holes in them and, and an old glow <laughs> light bulb sitting inside the bucket and through the holes in the big bucket the light would flow and now I play under the crystal chandeliers in the, the Radisson Hotel so that's been quite a change. I was the only uh, cocktail pianist and bar pianist in town, female anyway. Mm -hmm. And but now, oh, we have quite a few. And uh, I've seen changes and oh, that have been oh, just tremendous. Uh, not only in the music field, but all over Austin. They're, they're getting back to cocktail pianists. I'd, for a while, it was a little slow, and they wanted all hard rock or rock and roll or the jazz and that type of thing. But I see a lot of my friends that were that came to see fans that came to see me years ago. They come back and they want to sit in a in a lounge and be able to listen to quiet music and songs that they <clears throat> came up with. I went to high school there in Rockdale and uh, one of the uh, teachers there, he was transferred from Rockdale to Bartlett, Texas, which is about 40, 50 miles from Rockdale. And uh, <clears throat> so he knew that I was trying to play guitar, you know. Mm -hmm. I played a little bit around the school there, you know, got three or four of us up together. And uh, Yvetta Young, she was teaching there, so he was telling her about it. And she said, well, I believe I'm going to ride down to Rockdale, see if I can locate him, a blues guitar player. So she did.
I couldn't play with about one couldn't play that good one number, you know, but she was carried away with what I was doing. And <clears throat> so she said to me, said, I'm going back to Austin, and uh, so I'm going to see if I can't get you in Austin, you know. And I said to myself, oh, no, I'm not ready. And sure enough, she did. So she came back to Austin, and three or four days later, here comes Johnny Holmes, you know. Said, I'm from uh, Austin, Texas, and I heard that he played the blues, and uh, I need a good blues player. And uh, that's, how I got, that's how I got to Austin, through Johnny Holmes and uh, Yvetta Young. And been right here ever since. One fifty-two victory was strong. I'm telling you, it was strong, man. Yeah, we did that. No, I don't know how long. And then after that, then I branched out to different clubs. You know, Johnny most had the weekend. So I started going. Odessa Midland, and uh, Wake was good out there doing the oil boom. So after Victor Real started kind of uh, going down, I came through here and uh, I talked to Johnny Holmes. And I had Johnny Holmes out there and he didn't even come back, he stayed. And that's what Johnny did, and uh, then after that, well, Johnny would call me and I would go out there and stay a year or two and play around with the group he had and then I would come back to Austin and play here a year or two and uh, maybe go back. That's the way I did it up until about 58. Then I, I came back in and I stopped traveling. Ran into Bowser in uh, Odessa. But this time we were looking for a piano player, and uh, I don't know how Johnny found Irby somehow. But anyway, so we got ready to have rehearsal. Johnny said, "Oh, I've got a piano player coming. He wakes us up for playing. He'll be here later on this evening." So when Irby walked in. You know, wet clothes on and everything. I looked at him, you know, I said, oh, this man, he won't be able to make it. And the other came in and sat out on the stool, and he went up behind that piano, and I said, uh-oh. Man, he is too tough for us. <laughs> so that's how I met Irby. have been fiddling together ever since. 54, 55, somewhere along about there. That's how long we've been together. Really, we're getting more uh, uh, publicity and everything than I've ever gotten in my life, you know. And uh, you have more people running up and uh, hugging you and admiring you and thanking you and tipping heavy, you know. Back there then, we didn't, we didn't hardly know what a tip was. But uh, it makes you, makes you want to do more, you know.
Uh, so far as I'm concerned, you know, I just thought that the blues was something that you got a feeling from, not, you know, uh, uh, malice in your heart, you know. And uh, so that's how I categorized the, the blues for me, you know. It was just a feeling. It would just bring back some kind of memory, you know, of something that maybe you did or something in the past happened to you or something like that. Blues are here to stay, you know. There's gonna be somebody always playing the blues. Blues are not as hot as this other music is now in popularity, you know, but uh, blues are still here. I in 55, really. I didn't really get out on the streets until 56. And the first time I got out on the streets, I got a gig that night and been playing ever since. <laughs> I, I walked into a club and, and it was supposed to be a trio in the Victory Grill. And it was a duet, just two cats. At that time, that was the swainest black club in East Austin, was the Victory Grill. So during T.D. Bell's early years, the Victory was probably it. When I got in, the Victory was what's happening. It was. Everybody was going to the Victory Grill black, you know. I started playing in the Victory Grill right there. But, uh, after I pulled out of, the, out of the group and went down to the show bar, then the show bar was what's happening. And I'm talking about 57, see? And uh, then Charlie bought the show bar and changed it to Charlie's Playhouse. And from, from, the, from that time on, it was the Playhouse. That was it. Every star that came to Austin came to the Playhouse, you know. And it was during the time before all the integration and stuff, so blacks had to stay with blacks, you know. If blacks brought something to town, everybody had to patronize it because you couldn't go on the west side nowhere. But uh, believe it or not, during that time, there was nothing over there to go far because they wasn't booking things like that then, you know. to have a TV show in the late 50s. It was called Man Dig This. It came on every Saturday morning right here in Austin, Texas. That's how we got known starting off with the whites, you know. They'd see us on there every morning, you know, and they said, man, that stuff they playing must sound, kind of sounds good, you know. And that's what kind of started motivating white people to want black music with that show called Man Dig This. And then what happened was they start calling the East Side clubs for the band that they see on, t on TV. You know, how do you get in touch with that band? Then somebody would, whoever it was, told them, call Charlie's Playhouse, you know, and they did. 
And what would happen is they would come out to Charlie's Playhouse, see? And then pretty soon when blacks got there, there wasn't any seats. See? And that's where the whole thing started, see? And back in those days, then they opened up the, what they called the Vulcan Gas Company or something like that on a Congress over there. And they used to put together some stuff. One more time. Then they started with Armadillo World. Then they started bringing in some stuff. And then that's where things start changing, you know. A lot of white musicians wanted to start playing what the blacks was playing on the east side. And every one of them came to me. <laughs> right, I've taught so many guys on the east side, boy, it ain't funny. But at the same time, I was charging people for the lessons, you know. And like I tell a lot of guys, you know, a lot of black guys have told me, man, you crazy, I wouldn't be teaching them guys how to play like that, you know. I said, if they don't get it from me, they don't get it from somebody. And that's why I taught them, you know, with a lot of guys said, man, you crazy, man, a lot of them guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan, and they used to come out to the shack and listen to you and stuff. I never did teach Stevie Ray directly, but he used to come out to the shack. Bill Cameron used to bring him out there. And then he would take things from Bill Cameron that I would teach Bill Cameron, and he would use it. In fact, he got a, re a, a thing on his record that he does. And he got that from me. That was a definitely a fact. Well, the whole thing about the whole scene, if it wasn't for young whites and older whites, the blues scene would be zero. In other words, whites are the only ones that brought the whole blues back to this world because blacks was losing it, I mean completely, because guys like Muddy Waters and Johnny Lee Hooker, we had no respect for those guys. You know, young black people has no respect for Johnny Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters and, and Lightning Hopkins, and who is those cats? Man, you know, they, they had no respect, and we were losing it. I mean, you know, they were just slipping away from black people. My grandmother wanted me to play piano. She bought a piano. And I told her, I said, I, didn't, I don't want to play the piano. So I told her I wanted to play in the band. The word got out that anybody who wanted to be in the high school band was to meet on Saturday morning at Old Anderson Gym and meet Mr. Joyce. He was the band master at that time. I didn't know what I wanted to play, really. So I looked at all the horns that he had displayed there, and I put my hand on the trumpet. He said, all right, he wrote me down. So I take this information back to my grandmother. She sold the piano and bought me a trumpet. And that's how I got started. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I started playing trumpet when I was about 10. But back then you had uh, Louis Armstrong, I remember Ziggy Elman, and then all those trumpet players with Duke Ellington and uh, Count Basie's band, you know. And I figured right then, boy, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a trumpet player. So one day, one payday, my old man, he worked in the steel mills in Pittsburgh. He came home with a brown paper bag. 
He went to the pawn shop and got a trumpet for 10 bucks. Boy, he gave me that horn, man. That's the greatest day of my whole life. I never will forget that in my whole lifetime. I was living in Detroit, working at Ford Motor Company. And Hank Ballard in the midnight was working at Ford Motor Company. So we started gigging on the weekends, you know, up around Detroit there and, uh, and uh, Toledo and all around through there. I stayed with Hank Ballard and them for six years and went with Ella James for three years. Went with Otis Redden for three years. And went with Joe Tex for six years. That's how I got to Texas. During the time of Charlie's Playhouse, this was uh, in the 60s and mid-60s. Uh, it's where I met Pat. At that time, we were doing a talent show, which I was the MC and played in the band. Uh, Hank Ballard and the Midnighters came here, and Pat was with them. And he came on the talent show that Monday night and win first prize. <laughs> he told us, he told Hubbard, uh, blues boy Hubbard at that time was the band leader at the Playhouse, and he told Hubbard, say, the blues in G. We kicked it off, and old Pat turned the house out with blowing the blues. <laughs> I mean, Austin, especially Austin, we used to come, we came to Austin a long time, Charlie's Playhouse guy. That guy was talking a little earlier. Right up here on 12th Street from the Shalomar corner, clean up to where Sam Showcase used to be. It was 11, it'd be 11 bands playing up there on the weekend. I'm talking about 11 bands in a two block area. I ain't counting, I ain't had 11th Street in there now. Now if you want to put all that to Victor Grill, uh, Charlie's Playhouse, all them other little clubs in there. Right here on that little section of the east side of town, man, you have at least a good 15, 15 bands playing on the weekend. All the bands were just just localized in an area, and they they had support, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, each little club had its own little, well, little crowd, and they wouldn't go nowhere else. East Side was really it, especially that section over there, 11th and 12th Street. Uh, that was the strip. That was it there. It would be five, or 6,000 people mm -hmm. milling between there on, 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 on the tape from Friday, Saturday to Sunday. I'll tell you what happened. In the early 60s, Charlie's Playhouse, again, on a Friday night and a Saturday night, predominantly white. Because oh. Yeah. Because there was no place for them to go to get that kind of music. Right. No place. So Charlie's Playhouse was the key. It was the key. And uh, a lot of the little clubs died when things integrated, too, on the east side. Mm -hmm. People started going to the west side, to clubs. Yeah, I'm sorry to say this. But blacks is done, 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 let the blues get away, man. I got started playing uh, in high school, not really jazz, but playing music professionally started when I was in high school. I was playing uh, R&B with some bands around town in Corpus Christi, Texas this time because rock and roll wasn't that big then, but uh, we were playing it, but the white folks hadn't called it rock and roll yet, you know. When I graduated uh, high school and, and did a little short stint in service, then I came to Austin, Texas to go to Sam Houston. Well, that, by that time, it was Houston Dillardson. And that was in the late 50s. And uh, there were a lot of bands around Austin. Then uh, Blues Bar Hubbard, the Jets were playing at the College Playhouse. And there were a lot of other bands all around town. 
and uh, a lot of jazz musicians were here. And uh, the black neighborhoods were still flourishing. You know, you had a lot of black clubs in the, in the black neighborhoods, which we don't have now. You had uh, community leaders, you had musicians in the area, in the neighborhood that people looked up to and respected and wanted to pattern themselves after. So consequently, we had that feeder group thing happening. There were a lot of places to go and a lot of good music. And uh, <clears throat> that's how things, you know, really were happening back during the, during the late 50s here in Austin, Texas. And I would imagine it was happening the same way all over the place. In 1954 is when the federal government uh, passed a bill to integrate the public schools. And uh, my father told me, I remember him saying that, he said, this is the worst thing could ever happen to the black community. He said that in 1954. I see what my daddy was talking about. Before school integration, there were only black schools. You had your stars of the football team. You had your track stars. In other words, you had your students at those schools who were household words. Everybody in the community knew who they were. Everybody in the black community. So, and all the kids, little kids, had somebody that they could relate to, that they could look up to. Some black somebody. You don't have that now. Had we not had integration, we would have had more focus in the black area. We would have had more focus on what goes on within this given section of the town. Our children would have been more focused on what's happening, you know. Uh, the, the black rhythm and blues bands would not have died the death that they died because there will still be more black clubs, there will still be more venues for black musicians to play in. When integration did happen and we kind of shifted and moved away from the, the, the focus kind of shifted and moved away from the black community to other areas, black people had the chance to go to other nightclubs or go to other places that they had not previously been able to, to go in. And what happened, like the music that, that the, the white kids, the young white bands are being, are loving today, it was the music that T.D. Bell and Hubbard and those guys played in 1950. There's a certain amount of anger that you feel, because like, uh, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, got pushed to the top. Well, I mean, Steve Ray used to hang around Hubbard and people like that. And, and uh, <laughs> they're playing black music, man. That's what they're playing. They're playing something that they heard some black cat play. But they get pushed to the top, you know. Lord have mercy, look what we got here, you know. Uh, Angela Strelly, I gave her her first gig. She sang in my band, first gig, singing the blues. But yeah, you feel a certain amount of anger, you feel a certain amount of hurt at something you've given to somebody else and they get all the, the, the attention for it. Basically, I guess the bottom line is, I want to get the community more involved in music and pass the word on. Don't let the ball drop here. Don't let the ball stop here. The type of music that black people have created over the years, don't let it stop. Don't let it die. Uh, take it to 
the youngsters, exposed them to it.